Gutter. Gutter. Gutter, the gutter. On what ground? I'm shocked, shocked to find that gambling is going on in here. You're winning, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Everybody out at once. <laughs> Greetings. Good evening. Welcome to the gutter. Everybody gets here eventually. It's only a matter of time. Tonight, my guest, Odin Dasko. Odin. Howdy. Welcome. Good evening. And I will be discussing uh, the man, the myth, the legend, Hal Foster. And specifically, uh, probably a little bit of his early history, but we're really going to be focusing on the the strip that made him famous, which is uh, Prince Valiant. And uh, do you have uh, anything you kind of want to lead off with, Odin? About Hal Foster? Um, Just in general. I mean, we're also going to be talking about oh, your book, Unconditional in general, Shove. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, uh, got the little... in, the, in the comments saying who's ready to get shoved. And so we're definitely going to do some shoving here. Um yeah, I mean, we, we could talk about that for real quick, just say that it's in demand still, but won't be for very long. I'm thinking maybe two weeks into June uh, when we go to print, they'll shut it down. So it's very near printing, and that's when we're going to shut it down. So you got a little bit of time. Um, but that is a horror anthology book that I made that's 82 pages. And uh, it also has an added Cole story that is only in this campaign. So yes. And that is also the relation to the Hal Foster talk. Is the Cole of Atlantis story that you know about that that I did? The six oh, page, sure. six page story written in poetic meter, uh, and taken a lot of cues from some Hal Foster things. I mean, it's not Hal Foster, but who is? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the uh, I mean, just a little bit of background on uh, why this pairing Hal Foster with Odin. Uh, going back to before you even launched Unconditional Shove, uh, I believe we had you on the Witching Hour, and mm -hmm. you were talking about your book and everything, and uh, you mentioned that that's kind of the you were doing the side story for I believe at the time it was Luke Stone's uh, Out of Obscurity book, right, right, and um, you were mentioning that you were doing these uh, individual set pieces with this meter, and I mentioned that you know oh so you're doing like Hal Foster style Prince Valiant, and it like it seemed to click with you that yeah it lit up a so, little. Yeah, unconsciously, you were probably going down that road. You just didn't know that's what you were drawing from. And as soon as I said it, it was like every everything fell into place. And you're like, yes, yes, yeah. exactly. That's the parallel I was looking for. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm really excited, too, because, I mean, obviously, you have an appreciation for it. And not only yeah. that, you've got kind of um, a grandchild, if you will, of what Hal really did here with Prince Valiant. And I think yeah. it's, that, that's a cool, uh, bringing it forward into the modern age that that's you don't a see. Great, set. great, great grandchild. <laughs> well, was, that was a long time ago. Um, and by the way, towards the end, I will show some of these, uh, cold pages to give everyone a little sneak peek glimpse into what that is. So. Fantastic. Well, before we get going too, I do want to say, uh, Congratulations and thank you. Um, as a member of Broken Compass Comics, you handled the North American, American, I should say, yep. um, distribution for uh, Magnificent Bastards. I received mine yesterday. Fantastic book. Really looking forward to cracking those issues open. But uh, a huge thank you to both you and James, too, because you guys added this fantastic piece in with mine. And I just I really appreciated it. It was uh, oh, yeah, it's, it's really great. Cool. Oren. He drew that on a stream and said James could use it, so he made a print out of it. And uh, so thank you, Oren, 
for the yes. wonderful artwork. Yeah, for sure. And uh, before we jump in to uh, the wonderful story of Hal Foster, let's uh, greet the chat. We have absolutely uh, Eric Grant. Hello, everybody. Hello, Eric Grant. Thank you Hello, so Eric much. Grant. Always great to see you. Hello from the down under. We have Nefarious, one of my favorite human beings ever. He uh, he absolutely. has no filter lately, and it is so, <laughs> so appreciated. Uh, there are very few people that just tell you like it is. And uh, anytime I run into one of my fellow kinsmen, it's always uh, appreciated. So and then we have Hicks villain joining us. Yeah. Thank you, Hicks villain. And that what rounds up out the gutter because no one actually ever wants to be here. So <laughs> you don't stay in the gutter if you can help it. No, no, you don't. You always want to move on. But you do everybody end up there. Does. Everybody up. does. Oh, and we have a, we have a late arrival. I'll, uh, He's Canadian, oh, so he's probably running at Canadian polls. time. So it's Jay. Good to see you, Jay. Thanks so see much you, for Jay. swinging by. So jumping, uh, I guess, right into the meat here. Um, yeah. Like what? Before we get into kind of the history of it, I guess let's let's talk a little bit about it because I think everybody's familiar with Prince Valiant. Right. Um, you know, whether you were a kid and you open up the funny pages on Sunday, um, if you were if you gravitated to it, awesome. If you didn't, you probably just had no idea what it was, other than like. You know, every time you opened it throughout your childhood, it was always there. You know, Garfield came and went. Calvin and Hobbes came and went. But Prince Valiant is there every day. Always. And it's been there through multiple generations. And we'll get into when it started. But um, it, it's a little bit like Glenn Campbell's song, Wichita Lineman. Like everybody knows what Glenn Campbell sang, or sang Wichita Lineman, but nobody knows who wrote it. And if you ask most people, like, have you read Prince Valiant? They're like, oh, the comic? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, who started drawing it? Like, I, I have no idea. Right. The guy that wrote the song was Jimmy Webb. And the guy that created the comic strip was Hal Foster. But who is Hal Foster? And that's what we're going to try to get into here initially. Yeah. Uh, he, he was born on August 16th, 1892. Uh, he grew up in Halifax. Um, and father needed to move around for business and he ended up in Winnipeg and later in life he was quoted as saying that the oceanfront never left his mind and it's mm -hmm. interesting that he says that for a number of reasons because when we get into and start looking at some of the the, the pieces from Prince Valiant there's anytime there's a water scene it's extraordinarily oh, beautiful it's amazing what he could do yeah he's got just almost like a it's almost picturesque so he, he grows up in Winnipeg, and he wasn't a hunter or a fisher when he was in his, in his time at Halifax. But his father teaches him all that, and he becomes quite the outdoorsman as a young man. Yeah. And also quite uh, apt, I guess, physically, to the point that later in life he would ride his bicycle from Winnipeg down to Chicago on, a, <laughs> on more than one occasion. That's insane. Uh, but he was a little bit of a, a, a quiet kid. Um, he, he was quoted by multiple people that knew him in his childhood as being very observant. Uh, mm -hmm. But he was picked on and bullied a lot. And uh, in this regard, he shares uh, something similar to Jim Starenko in being picked on and bullied. And uh, one of the things they both share in common was he took an, um, an early interest in boxing and became quite a successful amateur boxer. Um, but then he, he started drawing. And in order to protect his hands, he stopped boxing because he really found a passion for drawing. So 1921, he moves from Winnipeg down to Chicago, and he starts working in various advertising and illustration fields. Um, he draws uh, pictures of corsets for magazines, basically. <laughs> and this is a period of time when there's not, photog there's not photography printing in uh, like catalogs or anything. So he's actually hand drawing all the individual details of the corset and it has to be exact because you're selling to women and God knows if you miss one thing, they're going to find it. <laughs> and he's very successful at this. So successful that uh, Polinsky Young Inc. Incorporated, which is a fairly large size advertising studio at the time in Chicago, um, their biggest clients were Union Pacific Railroad, uh, Johnson Outboard Motors, Wurlitzer Grand Pianos, the International mm -hmm. Truck Company. This is not a, uh, a small time gig. He goes <laughs> and quickly rises through the ranks uh, from 1925 on of being one of their head art guys and starts doing a lot of copy for him. 
Also during this time, he starts doing a lot of covers for Popular Mechanics, which is obviously still around. You can go to the you can go to your local yeah. magazine uh, stand if there's one at your grocery store and find a copy of Popular Mechanics. Um, so, and he does that for a number of years, fairly successful. By by 1928, he's the direct assistant to uh, J. Allen St. John, who's semi notable for a number of reasons, but. Um, Joseph Henry Neville, who's the owner of famous books and plays in Chicago, contracts uh, the the advertising agency that because he's got he's got this really strange idea. And his idea is he wants to take Edgar Rice Burroughs Tarzan novel and adapt it into a, a 10 week comic strip and sell it to King Publications yeah. and King Publications is all about it. Because comics at this point are, they're not just for kids. They're also trying to draw in uh, adults to read them and to make serialized stories so that you want to continue buying the issues. And what this is, is it's, uh, it, it's a secondary marketing angle that's come off of what the pulps are doing. And the pulps are selling really, really well at this time. So they present it to Jay Allen St. John, who turns it down. And he turns it down for... The same reason why Foster almost doesn't take it. And Foster is quoted as saying, um, I thought I was prostituting my art being a funny page artist. Right. <laughs> but at the end of the day, his family needs the money. Foster takes the job. Um, he, he does a couple of strips, resigns almost immediately. And then they convince him to come back. And the beginning of everything starts. Um, and it, when I say that these, these are epic, we're going to, we're going to, sh- I've, I've just got one. Cause I don't, we're going to revisit the Tarzan strips cause they're important for a whole different reason at, um, yeah. another show, but I do want to just show off one just so you can get the idea of it. But, uh, before I do, we did have some, uh, new arrivals in the chat. So, uh, greetings to my buddy, Rick Sailor. Always good to Rick see Saylor. you, sir. Good evening. And of course, Ray Hallock, Tubbs white guy. Good to see you, man. What's up, Ray? Good to see you. So Tarzan. So he starts doing Tarzan. And this is what an average Tarzan script or page looked like. <laughs> and these are these are not your at, at this time, a comic in a paper is not three panels. It's not four panels. It's not one block of panels. It's a page. Right. Um, and, and these would come in usual secondary inserts, and they would be fairly impressive. Um multiple pages just like a newspaper but they'd be like a mini newspaper in the newspaper and so that's and they'd be full page stories so this isn't like he's just drawing three pages or three panels a week he's drawing full pages and sometimes you'd get more than one page depending on what the context of the story was so that gives you an idea and the important part just to notice is again hal's coming from the illustration side of things. Mm-hmm. And he's also coming at it from a sense of economy. You've got to get things done now because there's more coming and there's no time to wait. So he uses blacks extraordinarily economically oh, to yeah. define detail. And we've got some great pieces from Prince Valiant that we'll show for later that really highlight this, but you can see it just in this page on how he's using um, heavy black to and it doesn't always represent shadow sometimes it's just for effect and you'll see more of that as we go through (laughs) so 1928 he starts doing tarzan and like i said he walks off he comes back um and he kind of struggles a little bit at first um he idolized illustrators like howard Pyle, uh Mm -hmm. which is if you're if you're familiar with Pyle's work you can immediately see it on, on that tarzan page um, he was also a huge fan of the painter Edwin Austin Abbey. Uh, his Richard III famously hangs at Yale's Art Museum. And I, I don't I didn't even bother a picture. But if, if you've ever seen it, one of the things that or any of Abbey's work, one of the things that Abbey is really great at is somehow he has an immense amount of depth in all of his paintings that gives you a feeling that you're not just looking at a painting, you're looking through a window at a scene. Right. And that's between piles visible influence and abby's sense of depth um those are two things that really start to just kind of blend and meld together and tarzan's like the the nascent form of the batter before he makes the loaf of bread (laughs) in the oven and uh, he's still kind of experimenting with some stuff and uh so and this continues for for quite 
a bit on. And so uh, January 7th, 1929, one of the first adventure comic strips is released in Tarzan. Um, and Foster draws the strip for almost six years. Uh, the, the Tarzan strip was revolutionary. I did say it's one of the first adventure comic strips. Adventure comic strips were a serial ongoing storyline that built on each individual week. Um, you Nobody wanted to miss a, a, a page right. and people would cut these out the individual pages and uh, you know, have, have collections of them. Cause you'd want to read it like a book. It was that engrossing and that, that beloved. Um, and it, they, they were, these were great too, because they really stuck to the story. Uh, it was, it was very realistic. All the compositions were very strong. Um, but again, that line work still showed that commercial illustration background. Yeah. And then the magic starts to happen. And 1936, Foster resigns from Tarzan. Uh, that initial 10 week, 10 week strip idea have gone well out the window a number of years ago. And he comes up with his own strip, and it's Prince Valiant. And on February 13th, 1937, the first strip is released. Uh, a little bit of background on what Prince Valiant is Valiant was a Viking prince uh, taken as a child from his homeland into the realm of King Arthur and kind of adopted into the culture. And he grows up. And man, I, I think at this point we just start talking about the art, Odin. Unless you've got anything yeah. really to add here. Well, I just wanted to quickly touch on it. And for one, real quick though, also, whenever you start going into the history and relating that, uh, I feel like a kid getting tucked into bed or something like all this. Tell me about how Foster again. <laughs> it's just uh, it's great hearing all this stuff. But um, the person of Hal Foster is kind of what you let off with. Uh, I was amazed the more I dug into who he actually was. Uh, you talked about kind of like a subdued personality, but an extremely masculine and manly personality as well. And I found that fascinating. So, um, cause I kind of contrasted it with my love for Robert Howard and how much of a like masculine kind of things he was into. And I'm like, but they are somewhat a dichotomy of personalities too. But I see similarities, as we're going to go into Prince Valiant now, between his Prince Valiant stories and uh, some of Howard's creations, like Cole and uh, Conan. There are certainly some similarities. And I don't know if Foster was influenced, but you never know. Right. Well, as they're contemporaries at this point, you've got... Yeah, more or less. I think the first Cole uh, and Conan stories were predate Valiant. Yeah, uh, no, they Valiant. predate Valiant, but those would have been coming out the time period when he was doing Tarzan, for sure. Right, right. So you're looking at that late 20s, early So contemporaries, 30s. but there could have been a little bit like, oh, I'm, I like that, and we're going to build on that. But I think I'll, um, these things are just common to, to man, these kind of stories that we love to hear. So it's not like I would think he would steal it. But I did see a lot of similarities to the uh, more Cole, even more so than Conan in the person of Prince Valiant. But um, they're all very similar in my mind, so. Oh, for sure. You know, and I, I think too, I'm, I'm going to go through and do this real quick because oh. before we start talking, before we start showing any of the, and we, we just have a, a, a random sampling of some of the, some Prince Valiant stuff, right. but um, here are some quotes about, if you don't want to, if you don't want to believe me, if you don't want to believe Odin, here are some quotes <laughs> on how far um, Hal Foster's reaches. Uh, Frank Frazetta, Foster would be my main influence. Joe mm -hmm. Kubert, guys like Foster, Raymond, meaning Alex Raymond, the creator of Flash yeah. Gordon, and Milton Caniff, uh, the, the creator of uh, Steve Cannon and Terry and the Pirates, um, as I said many times before, have inadvertently fathered an incredible number of cartoonists. Now, for those of you that listen to the show, you know that I subscribe to the Storinko School, which says that there are three men that are directly responsible for American comics being what they are today. Um, obviously, Joe Kubert is one. Jack Kirby is the other, and Wallace Wood is the third. Uh, John Buscema, uh, I think Hal Foster is perhaps the best storyteller in comics. Jack Kirby, actually, we'll get into Jack Kirby later, as well as Bob Kane, because both of them have some fun stuff. So I think at this point, <laughs> right. we're just going to start showing some pages. So this is an example of a, a Prince Valiant page, and this is what you would get. Um, the series started off as a full and then went to a half um, fairly midway through its run. Um, again, you're seeing those that, that heavy use of black, that fantastic right. line work. And this just gets better with time. Well, you um, pointed out the, the water, and you can see in those first two panels, 
Um, and these aren't even like epic water scenes, which he's done like raging storms and stuff like that. But uh, everything is so picturesque and simple in, in the line work, but it, I, I can't remember what you said earlier. Is it was, was you're referencing the paint the painter that he was inspired by? Yeah, Abby. Yep. Right, Abby. But it looks like you're you're seeing through a portal into a scene more so than just seeing a panel that was well drawn. Oh, for sure. If you look at that top uh, panel number three in the upper right hand corner, that's a, a really good sense of the depth, and it also shows. Um, again, it's his use of blacks. He doesn't go into any of the detail of the figures on the hill because they'd be silhouetted. He understands that the foreshortening is perfect, but yep. the depth of field that you get, not only do you get the sense that there's depth, but you get the sense that they're looking up at something, not just something that's distant. Um, it's it's little things that he does, like the curvature of that land. That just it's, the, yeah. the attention to detail is fantastic. If you look at the the full panel down below that, um, the filigree work on the robes, the detail on oh, the armor. Yeah. Um, this is Hal Foster's calling card. Um, it's well, it and is his a... character expression too. Sorry to interrupt, but like his no, no, character expression is, and it's not just facial expression. It is posture. He gets it so well. And uh, to when you mentioned Frazetta, that's one thing I always think of. Like you know, Frazetta is widely regarded as the goat of fantasy art. And when Frazetta says, this is where I drew a lot of, you know, the majority of my inspiration or however he phrased it, it's like, you can see it, especially when you look at Frazetta's black and white work and you compare it to this black and white, uh, you're like, yeah, I can see it. And compositionally, like that third panel, like you said, it's got that pyramid uh, composition, which always works. Absolutely. So then when you move on to another... So here's another one. Again, you see that black. Again, you see the contrast, especially in panel four when they're highlighted against the background. And you keep on seeing that detail level. In mm -hmm. this, uh, this particular one, um, Odin mentioned it in the last panel. You can see it a lot better in this one in panel three, again, in the upper right-hand corner with the, the water effect. The water, even in just black and white, looks alive. It looks fluid. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with his clouds and his smoke. It, it feels heavy and dirty and again it's just that that exceptional utilization of black and understanding depth and proportional um proportional sizing it's just it's fantastic stuff that you just you don't see this kind of work um really at all anymore oh uh, with this attention to detail well and it's, and what's crazy is that this is 1937 right and this is uh a precursor to uh a lot of you know obviously influenced entire generations all the way up till the present but like the bar that was set for visual storytelling in the comic at the time comic strip or the comic book medium is, is astounding like he's using a uh, brush and quill and those clouds in the in the last panel there at the top left corner uh he's using you know texturing you know i'm not sure what he's using but to create that texture but he didn't have a lot of like uh, influence to draw on for these kind of things. You know, this is probably him just innovating and he's innovating in a way that people are still trying to figure out. No, for sure. And I think when you, when you kind of get into it and I think, um, as you were talking, this is the early thirties, this piece, which is arguably probably one of his more famous pieces. Oh, yeah. um, this gets a lot of uh, recirculation. In fact, it's the piece I dropped earlier today on Twitter. Um, this yeah. is from, this is from 1938, uh, June of 38, actually. Yeah. And uh, Valiant's holding right? a bridge against a horde. And um, it, it, it's just epic. Now, one of the things that uh, if you haven't noticed yet, that is, uh, it makes Prince Valiant uh, really stand apart from almost every other strip or comic at the time. There are no word balloons. Um, everything mm -hmm. is told in text block or caption. It yeah. is, it, and it's it, like on, on this one in particular, and you'll see this a lot as we go through, you'll notice that the bridge isn't painted, nor is there any stonework. There's faint detail around it, but it's blank. And again, it's utilization of space and understanding where to even put it. He could have put that anywhere, but he put it right underneath Valiant. Mm. And so your eye is immediately drawn to what? Your eye is drawn to Valiant and then the text block and you explain it. So somehow 
he understands the page and the dynamic dynamic aspect of how your eye crosses it and where to focus the eye. The text always seems to be right where it should be. Um, yeah, he really so understands the structure and the layout of the page. This is something my personal opinion is, is that modern artists do not take into account at all. And it is a fantastic that, I mean, this is 1938 and he understands it so exquisitely and it's being yeah. executed so well. And you can look at comics that are by people that credit Hal Foster as a huge influence that don't do it anywhere close to this. Well, 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later, even today ever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's um, it's just exceptional that there's so many things to take away from his work, and uh, this isn't even really what he wanted to do. As he said, he was really he felt like he was prostituting himself, um, doing cartoon pages and comic pages. Well, once he got his own, that was a big step for him. Was uh, I don't want to work on Tarzan. I don't want to work on somebody else's story. Once he got his own story, he really owned it and went. This is the epic tale. I want to create. I'm going to do the art. I'm going to write it. And uh, here, it really was magnificent from beginning to end. This For piece sure. in particular, when I was talking about the Frazetta influence, there is a Frazetta uh, painting that is somewhat similar in composition and, and posing of the action. But uh, I can look at this and I'm like, this inspired Frank Frazetta as much as anything. I think, you know, I don't remember how fr old Frank Frazetta is here, probably like 15 to 20 ish. He probably mm -hmm. saw this and went like, this is what I want to do. And a lot of people credit Frazetta as like the best fantasy painter. And, uh, but I see the influence all over the page. Uh, yeah, for sure. And they're compositionally amazing. And we've got a bunch of other ones. This is, this is one of my favorite uh, panels. And I want to talk about this a little bit. And Odin and I talked, discussed a little bit in the pre-show. Yeah. Um, this piece uh, just it, to me, it has an incredible impact. Um, it's the high contrast with just the exquisite level of detail. And again, his use of those blacks and it's not where shadow should be. He's doing it for both economy. He doesn't have to draw detail, but right. he's also guiding the eye and he, he's hiding what he needs to hide. But at the same time that this whole piece looks like it's flying it, that those horses are coming at you. And part yeah. of that is the blacks used underneath but also it's the blacks used on the, those shields, almost like it's, it's rising up off of it. It's, it, there's an incredible balance in the natural orientation of the figures. Uh, and it, it's not meant, I, I don't, I don't know for sure. I, I get a strong sense that there's a beautiful glide path for the eye up across mm -hmm. the dynamic of this from exactly where you'd expect it to see you're coming up you're coming down across and and you're coming kind of a, across those horses and the riders and that action becomes fluid um as you're moving even though it's a static image and you i this piece really sold that for me when i was going through and looking at them that man this is just such a dynamic one well if you look there's an arc to the horses heads the horses bodies and to the heads of the riders even the one in the background uh that creates a circular shape um, that is just pleasing to the eye. And then uh, you can't, if you're not painting and you're using line work to create the effect of like the blur of the smoke kicked up from the horse's hooves, he just went to, I'm going to use heavy black above that and I'm going to use uh, heavy black on the ground and then use quill, uh, just some line rendering. Uh, light line rendering to create that that blur effect that you can create with paint in a whole easier way where you just uh you know basically blur the paint and wipe a big brush across it but uh, to do it with line work is a is a skill and he's obviously got that he's got every kind of um inking skill you would need oh yeah. but there is compositional things the use of the black where all of the the main black is very centralized right there on the the horses and yeah it's a beautiful piece for sure and in this man these they just get better i mean um when, you, when you're looking at some of these and this this one really kind of rang out to me i mean it, they, it almost looks like a, a 14th century or a 15th century woodcut it looks like something that gustave Doré could do but this is oh, printed yeah. <laughs> in a newspaper 
Um, and again, it's that detail. If you look at the the gentleman on on the horseback, he, you his his arrow quiver that's on his saddle, the details just right there. And it's just a small little touch, just a little design, but your eyes drawn to it, and you still have that dynamic. Again, the blacks are being used. It's it's just time and time again when you look at these. The, it's the understanding of the layout. It's the understanding of the page. And it's just the, the whole composition is just, it, it's panel after panel, panel after Perfect. panel of brilliance. Brilliance. Yeah. Well, and if you look at this or go back to that one real quick, yep. uh, the economy of line work and the subtlety to not, you know, I know I get into this habit and lots of us artists probably do where you're overdrawing way too much. Um, and he, he's going in the background I just need simple shapes and maybe some shadowy lines to represent things. I'm not going to draw them out in the foreground. I'm going to draw them out a bit more. But even then, he was very economical with what he was doing uh, to not overdraw. And he could he could not overdraw in such a beautiful way that it's uh, it's better than most people could do drawing entire shapes with every bit of detail they can think of. Um, all those horses and then a compositionally all the dark is mostly centrally right there in the middle uh, to draw the eye a certain way so extremely oh well yeah done. yep yep so th this is from uh, 1942 December uh, this gives you an idea again of that action and uh, again you just see it's a simple text block there's not much added to it and but you you get that sense of motion you get the sense of it, things are fluid Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, on this, um, if you look like, how do you, how do you draw a guy's arm to show that it's wrapped with leather? Well, you just drew a bunch of little lines and you make the background of the shield black and there's your detail. And, and this there. works, man. It's just, it, the chain mail with the stippling. Um, yeah. it's, it, you, I think the important thing there is you'll notice that it's used sparingly, but it gives you the impression that Valiant's armored. Forever used on captain america afterwards <laughs> <laughs> yes and uh yeah that's that's what you'll see um you know a little bit here we're gonna get to uh jack what jack kirby uh took away from this well you know and it can't be overstated his you know we're i was talking a lot about his economy of line work and still creating these captivating images but his economy of uh text and uh i read an interview where he was talking about um how you can only put so much text, you don't want to overdo it or underdo it, and and you only have so much. But as I was reading through Prince Valiant, it's it's pretty amazing how little he would tell in the text, and he would use the image to portray so much. And um, again, all of these things are very masterfully done and very well thought out. And on a oh, time. And, and, and I think if you go if you go back to this page that we were talking about, it, it it's two sentences per panel, um, yeah. and it it moves, it clicks, it hits. Um, you don't get bogged down. One of, one of the most idiotic statements um, that I've heard is, you know, oh, you need to dial down the text. No, you need to make sure your text fits what you're doing. Yes. Go back at go back and look at any of Kirby's new God pages. There's a lot of text, but it flows and it works and it's strategically allocated in where it is in the panel. Where it's and placed that's, is important. Yeah. And that's that's an understanding of the artist, what the story is trying to tell. And the story is fluid both and that's when you know it's really working, is when you see that fluidity. Um, and sometimes, I mean, when, when you're on a, a book with a, a writer and an artist, you can tell if they're simpatico or if they're fighting. And they're not agreeing with each other. The same thing if you, and you can have that work. You can have a great writer and a great artist that are totally with it. And then your letterer, letterer can come through and completely ruin it if they don't right. know what they're doing. <laughs> That's true. But, um, and you know, it just, it, it doesn't get worse. It just keeps on getting better. And uh, this is from 1957. And again, you're seeing, um, if anything, you're seeing an evolution now. You're seeing him do a, a even finer details in in the panels yeah. um and again you see the water here um it, th that love of water definitely echoes across this there's almost a certain I, i'm not going to say reverence but it feels like something akin to reverence that goes Could on be, when he's yeah. drawing water because it's when I mean, you have a static panel but there's action happening around the water the water's always rippling the water's always moving in everything that he does 
And uh, as going through the going through my, my books on this, the, I just kept on going back to that quote that the the ocean was always with him, and it never mm. left his mind, because yeah. that's that was one of the takeaways I took. It's like, man, there's just there, he has some some fascination or desire for water and loves it. And the irony is, uh, by this point, he's living, I think, in Kansas City, uh, where his wife's <laughs> family is from. So he's moved even further away, and he's now as landlocked, landlocked as he gets. <laughs> so. Yeah. And again, uh, this is from 1964. Much uh, later, yeah. Yep, you're much later. You're seeing, and you start to see this um, by about the early 60s, uh, right up until the end when he stops drawing the book. Um, you're going to see the black start getting used a little bit heavier and maybe <clears throat> not quite as econo economic as they were prior to this. Um, I'm not right. saying he's slowing down. He's slowing down a little bit. He's been doing this book for 30, or doing this strip for 30 years at this point. Yeah, that's a long time to do one story or one character. Um, but even still, there's a... Like, when I look at this, and I know you and I both share a love for Savage Sword of Conan and, and a lot of Buscema's work on that. I look at this, it looks like it came straight out of Savage Sword. One, well, it does. And it's, it's funny you say that because Foster was... He was constantly... Uh, he had a general idea for where the story was going, but he was constantly using things that he saw or heard mm -hmm. as influences for individual strips. And so he would, he would take trips and he would read books. And so whether he was reading fantasy um, or medieval history, a, a phrase or a word would give him an idea for a plot. And right. that might carry across four or five, you know, weeks um, for a grand arc. And that's something that's kind of important to note here. Right. For only having two to three sentences a panel and really only having six to nine panels each week, uh, Foster tells an incredible story. Oh, yeah. it is. It is epic in both scope and accomplishment, but it's fully engaging. Um, when I when I said earlier that people would cut these out and collect them just so they could reread them. It's that engaging. It's the kind of thing you just you For it's sure. a hate. It, it, it it sounds cliche, but it literally is a page turner because you want to know what's going to happen. <laughs> right. A page turner where you didn't have a second page till the next week. It, exactly. And it's, <laughs> it's amazing that he was able to accomplish that in a comic strip. So this is something I really quick want to touch on because you talked a lot about his ability to draw water. He drew some of the most uh, majestic castles and he always used this camera angle uh, to show the scope and the majesty of these castles as they approached them. So it was always some people standing just outside, uh, gazing at the majesty of the castle. And he used that many times, and he would draw such cool castles. With economy, you know, again, <laughs> right. economical how he, how he did it. Well, and this is and this is also um, something that I, we really, we haven't even touched on yet, is... He didn't just draw, it, it wasn't just block panels. Um, he was inventive in how he would structure things. And so you'd get pages like this occasionally yeah. with one beautiful image and then these gorgeous inset panels. And I could not get a high enough resolution copy of this um, tonight that does justice to the detail that's in these. But right. trust me when I say every ounce of detail that you see in every other page that we've shown is present in each one of those smaller inset panels it is, is it is exquisite his line work and the detail that he put in <clears throat> uh, if you look on the uh <clears throat> excuse me the lower left hand panel of the boat you yeah. can faintly make it out but he actually stippled the nails oh yeah 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 um, it, on the middle right, uh, there's the castle scene. Somebody's walking towards the gate. If you kind of squint, you can see that he actually did faint um, line work to give it the impression that there's brick. It's right. it's little things like that. The main castle and the main image, you can make out the ramparts on the walls. Um, the turrets, the top of the turrets, you can actually see the shingle yeah. lines. It's It's always exquisite level detail on everything, but none of it drowns out the image. None of it overtakes the image. It, it all blends and it's all just exquisite. 
in its um, execute. I guess I'm using the word exquisite too much, but man, I just can't praise this <laughs> stuff enough. That is a good it, adjective for his work, though. <laughs> So, I mean, that's that's kind of an overview so far. There are a few more things I wanted to go over before we jump over and start talking about your stuff here, Odin. Yeah, um, and I one had, of them uh, was something I was going to share too. But um, oh, okay. after you go, um, okay, yeah, because earlier I have the a book I was going to show real quick of how far. Yeah. Um, well, earlier I mentioned that we were going to get to a point where I mentioned uh, Jack Kirby and Bob Kane. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Both Kirby. Both Kirby schools. and Kane, obviously, because of their generation, were hugely uh, influenced by what Foster was doing and did. Um, Kirby, to the point that uh, there was a period when, when he was over at DC and he was looking to create a character. Uh, the character was a demon and it was going to be called Etrigan. And he, he thought back to what he could use to kind of get give this character something that's just visceral and evil but still has depth and there's character there and it's, there's more to it than just this demon's face. And he thought back to a, um, a strip in a series where Valiant dons the mask of a, of a, a mask made from the skin of a duck and makes it look <laughs> demonic. Yeah. And if you look at this face, <coughs> this is, this is the nascent form of the demon <coughs> Etragon. And the Jack Kirby lip didn't, it's a lift, man. It's, it's a, a lift. heavy lift. <laughs> <laughs> I told um, you when you first showed me, I said, oh, that's the demon. I didn't yeah. <laughs> even know how Foster drew that. And that was Prince Valiant in that costume. Yeah. So, and then the other one is uh, everybody, you know, here on the gutter, we really like to talk about Bob Kane because uh, before Xerox <laughs> invented their copy machine, Bob Kane was the human version of the Xerox machine. <laughs> <laughs> and in the first um, half dozen issues of Batman. Um, if you go through Hal Foster's Tarzan, Bob Kane directly lifts um, positions because Foster did such a dynamic job of positioning Tarzan in action poses. Yeah. In fact, the classic image of that early Batman where he, or even today where he's crouched on the edge of a building is actually a direct lift from early Hal Foster works with Tarzan of him crouched on a branch. Um, and you can overlay them. And cause of course it's Bob Kane. So he's going to directly <laughs> copy people. And uh, I'm sure while he was copying people, he was assuring Bill Finger that, you know, no, man, we're going to, we're going to share everything half and half. It's going to work out. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so that's a little bit of that. Um, I did want to show a picture of the man as well. Here's, uh, here's Hal actually working on a Valiant uh, a page. Gives you an idea of the scope and the style. And this is from about 1956. Um, and if there's anything you take away from this, one, look at the binder that's to his right. That is his script for the mm. year because it's nice. all written ahead of time. And the other thing is how clean everything is. He was yeah. he was very detail oriented. Again, he came from advertising, so everything was clean, everything was orderly, it was structured, and that that's how he lived his life. He was a very structured, as Odin kind of suggested that he was a he was a man's man. He uh, he had order in in his daily being, and he kept his he kept his surroundings very organized and neat and structured. So well, that. You, that Pull up that image again yeah. real quick. Because the thing that strikes me is he's writing a character, Prince Valiant, which is, a, you know, it, there's a lot of regality and uh, nobility in the story. It revolves around King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. And I look at him inking this page, and it just screams regal. You know, his <laughs> posture is really good. Uh, he's got the glasses there. He's, he's uh, intently focused. Uh, it just... It's like the character, it makes sense. You're like, what does the guy look like that's drawing these amazing pages? And you see this image, you go, that's that's kind of what I pictured. <laughs> you know, like you said, clean, right. orderly, uh, good posture. He just uh, has a regal air about him. And, and, and several pictures that I've seen of Hal Foster have that. And he was a very subtle, uh, subtly strong person. And it yep. was, it's impressive. Yep. So sadly, um, Foster did, uh, he lived to right. He lived to 89, uh, but right. he passed away on June, uh, July 25th of 1982. And I was actually rather shocked about this. I, I did a pretty deep dive. I was trying to find any, uh, video 
of him interviewed. I've got a ton of written interviews, really? um, but I could not find any any decent um, video interviews. So that that was kind of disappointing. Uh, I got to admit that was kind of a, like a bummer. I really like That's hearing perfect. a lot of these old uh, these legends talk. You want to hear himself. his voice. Right. And uh, you don't know, was he soft spoken? Was he gruff? I mean, Kirby's gruff. Like you think you see Kirby right. and you think he'd be soft spoken. Right. And no, Kirby's gruff. He sounds like a sergeant in the army, he, like, you know, Brooklyn voice, even right? in the seventies. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jack yeah. Kirby. Comics will break your heart. Kid. So uh, Hal Foster, uh, birth name, Harold Rudolph Foster, yeah. uh, 1892 to 1982. He won the ink pot award in 1977. Uh, one thing I did want to mention, because in going through everything, I was shocked to find this. One of the earliest art influences that he cites is J.C. Leindecker. And I don't see that in any of his work. Hmm. So I don't know how Leindecker fits in. Um, I'm most familiar with some of Leindecker's later stuff. So I, I don't know if his earlier work, there's more of a dynamic or a, a, a structure layout that he kind of took from. But I, I couldn't see any of uh, Leindecker's later stuff here. Well, and I imagine, like, I know for me, like, I can cite some influences and people could scour through my artwork and be like, I don't see it. It's like, I'm fine with that. Like, <laughs> uh, you know, it, you don't have to see the influence. And sometimes I use the word rather than use uh, influence, I'll use the word inspiration. Um, right. Because, like, whatever fuels you creatively, it doesn't mean you're, you know, again, we're not all Bob Kane out here. <laughs> <laughs> but something will spark, you know, because I can talk about Frazetta uh, and his influence. I can talk about Hal Foster and his influence. And I go, well, if somebody can see it, that's great. But I hope, I hope you don't. But the, the Howard Pyle, like, I think it's Howard Pyle, right? Yeah. You know, I, I see yeah. that in every That panel. we can see. Yeah. Everyone yeah. can see that. So. And even uh, even to a degree, I mean, even though Abby is a painter, um, like I said, if you look at Abby's paintings, especially that Richard the Third painting, it catches yeah, the I'll have to depth. look that up. Um, yeah. you see you see it come across in the page, especially when he's got um, like in a couple of those pages that we were looking at, where you've got a group of soldiers or a group of knights standing together. Even that bridge scene with the horde of Vikings or the horde of barbarians storming across, right. that's that's definitely Abby, where you're seeing mm. that the the congestion of human and just it's a mass of meat moving but each one's dynamic and each one's independent and it's not one it's not one mass it's a bunch of individuals in a mass and i think that that's where you see that more but to kind of divert back over to you man um you you've got a couple of things going on you've got unconditional shove and then you're you're in sign up mode right now for kill them dead, which will push kill them dead off because we've I've got a really great idea to connect <laughs> that to something else that we've briefly okay, talked cool. about. But uh, unconditional shove, you know, I and I think I, I'm looking forward to it. I've, I've seen a lot of the pages, so. and I know Corey Feldman has a has an opinion on this. That's a very serious book, man. So <laughs> it's a serious book. Yeah, it's a serious book. Talk to me a little bit about unconditional shove where does where does this come from yeah well and uh, i'd say it's a serious book it's not a serious book it's actually somewhat uh tongue-in-cheek at moments but um but i i love that quote or i love that part in that movie unconditional shove it comes from and you had mentioned this this is the first book you know i've always wanted to make comic books it's kind of a thing and uh you know we all kind of anybody who's a creator in this space we're kind of like now's the time i'm finally doing it and as I did it, I had a an idea that was going to be an ongoing series, and I decided not to go that route. And uh, it circles around to something that you had mentioned to me, and I've heard you mention it on uh, on the Saturday Night Show with uh, on Jeremy's show, is that your first book don't don't do your baby. Now, unconditional shove is kind of my baby, in the sense that I love anthologies. But I was originally going to do an ongoing series, and then I went, you know what would be funner and probably a better way to start is to do anthologies because you're constantly creating something new. And I also liked that notion of, like, every story is a new universe. Every story is you're, you're peering into another universe. And I've always been a big fan of Twilight Zone, um, Tales from the Dark Side, Monsters, all these old anthologies that I grew up with. Uh, Tales from the Crypt, and then the comic books as well, to where you just kind of like peer into a little time where something crazy and fucked up happens, 
and uh and a lot of times it has a twist it has a funny uh kind of aesop's moral at the end at times and i always found that it's what i've always like lean to when when i when i'm looking for something to watch i go find an anthology and just watch a quick show and and love it so that was the idea behind unconditional shove was all those horror sci-fi um again i've mentioned twilight zone a lot because i love that twist and aesop's moral kind of uh ending um and i went yeah i want to make a book like that so that was the idea behind shove and uh, and again it was like like I was mentioning before, you said, don't make your baby on your first book because you got a lot of growing pains and learning process. And in that mindset, and I, I didn't, I decided this before I heard you say that, but it made sense to me in that mindset. I'm like, I can constantly be making new stories. And if I find something that hits, you know, if I, if I have one, you know, anthology story that everybody's like, I absolutely love that. I want to hear more. Maybe it spins off into something, you know? So Gotcha. That was kind of the idea. A little long-winded, but I'll I'll take it because that, that had some great detail to it. <laughs> yeah, but you know, when when we're you know talking me. about the book itself, I know it's two stories. Um, that, so when you mm. say anthology, it's a two-story anthology. It's not yes. It's eighty two forty pages. I think is roughly what they are. Roughly, I mean, one's bigger than the other, but yeah, it's eighty-two pages and it's two stories. So it does kind of throw people off. They're like, oh, in eighty-two pages, I expect like six in an anthology or something, you know. So really, I mean, you're, you're just kind of slamming two issues together, almost. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. So when when you when you talk about it's an anthology, what what were your main influences in kind of constructing, even wanting to do an anthology? Because re realistically, I mean, the indie comic scene anthologies are not exactly something that's flying do off well. the shelves. Yeah, <laughs> they don't do well. Um, well, my influence is it's kind of like what I said earlier was like. I did want to do an ongoing series, but I went. Mean, it'd be funner to just create a new universe every little story and see what clicks. <laughs> um, but you know this about me, and, and we've talked about this a lot: is uh, the old EC stories and creepy and eerie were some of my favorite comics. I loved the artwork. I loved the little quick hitter stories. Uh, even like in eerie, they would be serialized, but they were still kind of like like Hal Foster stuff, where it's like. It's pretty short, and you got a teaser waiting for you on the next round. Right. Um, well, and a lot of that stuff that you're citing, I mean, a lot of the stuff that was published in Creepy and Eerie were reprints from the old EC comic days. Right. And those guys are direct corollaries to our topic tonight of Hal Foster, because they right, right. they're the next generation coming up in the 50s that are following along with Prince Valiant, were inspired by Alex Raymond, and went right into that same style and so even to a large degree um when i had uh, neff and ognan on yeah. we talked about warren comics picto fiction yeah. line which also directly ties back and it has a, owes a huge influence to hal foster which we didn't bring up because this episode was scheduled but <laughs> when you when you look back do you you know we talked a little bit about that that subconscious draw that you kind of went with your call story that that was the style and that was the flow and you just didn't realize it. Do you looking back at unconditional shove, do you see any major like breakthrough moment or kind of drawing that same, that same connection to the two stories in shove? Was there a particular book or a particular artist that really resonated that really kind of guided your path and what, what the direction was you took? Cause you're both a writer and the artist. So, I mean, you could take that yeah. a couple of ways. Well, and because of that, there, there's like a million breakthrough moments for one, never having actually done it. You know, I've made my own sequential art throughout my life, but to say I'm going to actually make something and publish it took on a whole new meaning. And so it was such a huge learning process. Uh, last week you had Dean James on and, and you and I talked about this too, is uh, you, you've been a good artist, you've written and you're finally like putting something out, but like, you don't know till you know. You don't know till you actually do it. So you stumble through a lot of it. And it's been a phenomenal, wonderful process. But the appreciation I have as I go back to something like Hal Foster, again, where I'm like, this guy didn't have a lot to draw inspiration from. He was creating inspiration. He's the OG in a lot of ways. And I'm going, uh, you know, I have all that to draw off of, but now I have such an appreciation. And I kind of went in like a reverse order, you know, started... 
as a 90s kid, you know, and being infatuated with all the image titles. And that was my life in comic books when I was young. And then as time went on, I went backwards, you know, and the further back I go, I end up here at Hal Foster and I go, this is better than everything that came <laughs> afterwards. How did I not know? You know, and I've, you know, we talked about this. I've, we've all read uh, Prince Valiant in the comic strips. But until you've sat down and done sequential artwork and you've tried to tell a story with visuals, you don't know the how much you can appreciate something like what Hal Foster did with Prince Valiant, where you go, the the amount of, I don't know, care he took with it to like tell the story proper and uh, it's phenomenal. So that, that backwards process has been huge for me, like going back, because I remember then I got into like a Bernie Wrightson phase and then I went back to like old EC titles and uh, Graham and Gills was one of my favorites and got in like a Graham and Gills phase or a Wally Wood phase, you know, and then go back and it's like, now I'm kind of like just for the show and just in general, like, oh, this how Foster stuff is mind blowing. It's amazing. So, so that's been my process and journey through the entire. And so then uh, I'm really excited for volume two because I'm like, oh, I take a lot of those lessons that I've learned kind of clunkily stumbling along and, um, you know, they're just going to keep building on, building on themselves. So. Nice. When you, when you, as you're going through and you're doing sequential art for the first time, what was one of the most difficult things you found with doing sequentials as an artist? Uh, I think a lot of it is, uh, you know, you, you hear these things like, uh, you know, drawing the eye in certain directions and, and telling the story through the panels. And so sometimes you get really caught up in that and you're like, I really want to, and then you lose track of, uh, what you're trying to convey and so there's there's lots of actually actual plates that you're balancing to try to uh not only direct the eye um use composition and uh i think that's a lot of it i one of the things is i've always drawn just for my own enjoyment and this is the first time i'm like not the first time i'm making money off of what i'm creating but in a published kind of way. And so there was a little more pressure to like uh, do it the right way. But I think sometimes when I was thinking oh, I need to do it the way, the proper way. And uh, I think sometimes that actually tripped me up to where I'm like, uh, no, lean into your own style um, because it's uniquely you rather than trying to ape what you've always been told is the right way to do it. How long did it take you to find that particular style? Oh, well, I'm still finding it, but <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I don't know that there was ever a time. It was always like, a, you know, start out like trying to copy what you've seen other people do. And I could never get anything to look exactly like how I wanted it to. And so it just evolved into, <laughs> into its own thing. So. Yeah, yeah, I don't so know. Now, if there was an you you mentioned you you mentioned earlier. I mean, obviously, if we can, I'd like to get to the cull thing. Um, yeah, but we can. Um, you mentioned earlier there were a couple of things you wanted to show um, from your own Prince Valiant collection. Do yeah, you yeah. Highlight those real quick, and I'm gonna switch my camera. It'll just make it easier because I got this overhead cam, but I just gotta set it up. Um, now, so are real these quick, the, are these the Fantagraphics collection? Yes, it's the Fantagraphics Volume One through Three. Yeah, I highly recommend these guys. Uh, this I, should I, be in everyone's library, right? If you're if you if you're a fan of comic books, if you love even if you're just an art fan, uh, this is really something you should own. Right. They're not they're not priced terrible. Most all of Fantagraphic stuff is very reasonable for what you're getting on page count. Uh, they're well, it's individual. A box set, three volumes, and it was you know you get it for about a bill. You know, yep. you can find it for less, but if you find a used one, but. And they're all oversized, as you can see from the general size there. He's pulling out of the slip. Cover. Yeah, they're not quite like artist edition size, but they're they're the big size books. So let me uh, switch my camera here. Get this overhead one. Because I got some coal art over there. But... Look at this. I got something highlighted. It was actually a story arc um, from volume one, which I'd been going through. Let's see if I can... Uh... There you go. And also, I got this nice metal bookmark here. Hey, for a team bookmark. Yep, this was the Shant 
bookmark. Nice strong metal one. Um, so there's this arc about um, this is one thing I really appreciate about the story of Prince Valiant is everything grows with his person. You know, he's a young man at the beginning of the story, um, and you see him mature uh, not only in his in his character but in his skills and in his uh, diplomacy, whatever, you know, like throughout the story, he's constantly maturing and you mature with him. So it's really fun. But this particular story, because, because we showed a bunch of images, but sometimes it's nice to see the, the layout of a page that he would do, because again, you don't, he's not drawing from very many influences. He's kind of creating it, creating comics as we know him in a certain sense. Uh, this so he became Gawain's, Sir Gawain's uh, squire as uh, as he helped him. And that's how he ends up at the at King Arthur's court. And there was a betrayal that happened in this story. But I wanted to highlight uh, just the, the imagery and the pacing of full pages. And this one here. I'll show this real quick. And Val batters his adversary into a more peaceable frame of mind. <laughs> that's a little subtle and, humor. I think he threw that in every once in a while as well. He does. And, you know, that's one of the things that uh, we really haven't touched on. And I, I always try to kind of gear these appropriately to my guest. But the the right. writing um, on Prince Valiant, right. there's, there's an appropriate level of humor, but it, it's still engaging. And this is not written for children. Uh, this is written no, with, no, no. With, with fairly adult concepts. Not extremely adult is by no means R rated, uh, especially given the time. But there's right. there violence occurs, uh, people die, and uh, there's there's adult concepts and themes that normally you wouldn't expect to see in something of this nature, and that that speaks to its longevity. Um, for, like I, like we talked right. about, Foster drew this from thirty six until seventy. Um, by nineteen seventy, he was kind of slowly withdrawing. And uh, started handing over more and more of the uh, the work to his understudy and assistant, who is was still drawing it um, into the early two thousands. Yeah, and it, it is it's just it, it's amazing. Uh, when he did finally retire, he finally walked away from the strip completely in nineteen seventy nine, and uh, passed away just three years later. So there there is some semblance of possibly that you know, he was he was living vicariously through this, and this was keeping him going for a long period of time. Yeah, you could uh, definitely see it. Like I was talking about the the kind of noble noble personhood of the the man, how how Foster, and how it kind of like it resonates in this character of Prince Valiant. So it's a funny story. He, uh, kills a guard, but he has to go undercover, so he like frays some rope and makes a fake mustache. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this was some of the stuff I really liked. Was uh, uh, just his night scenes and just using silhouette and you know a lot of these things we use today and we go he was doing this in 1937 yeah, that's when this one was published you know and, and oftentimes uh you know i'll be i'll be harped on for news. how i speak of the the legacy of comics and the history of comics but um innovation just like this doesn't occur and when you when we have to go all the way back to Thir the 30s, the 30s, the 40s, right. um, to see things that are still not done properly, it's it's shocking to me. Um, th this should be just standard. And again, I mean, as as uh, Odin's flipping through these pages, you see that layout, that shot of the stairs with the ramparts from that angle, like that is, okay. yeah, this is just it's amazing that you're even seeing that kind of thing. He's taking things, and you get you, you see this with Alex Raymond as well with Flash yeah. Gordon. Um, you, you see perspectives and shots done that just has such a care and such a oh, the level of detail and most importantly the sense of order is yeah. just uh, astounding. I love this long panel because um, when you're speaking of sensibilities, it gives a sense of scope and uh, you know it's like he's jumping. You could draw. You could cut it off here. Wouldn't wouldn't be half as good. You know, make right. a long elongated no, that, panel. You all, you're also seeing something that um, is never done anymore, and that is the numbering sequence. The numbering, how are, yeah. How you are yeah. to read the panels. 
Um, this was something that was predominantly wow. done throughout the 40s and a little bit into the early 50s. You see this a little bit with some of the mid-tier, um, or not mid-tier, it's the mid-range um, Will Eisner, the Spirit as well. Oh, yeah. Um, and it's it's just, it's era. It has nothing to do other than that. So Well, sometimes, uh, you know, I wish some crazy page layouts in modern comics had that. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I don't know where, where I'm supposed to read next. Right. This one yeah, is pretty no. obvious. It's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm like, that seems pretty obvious, but he felt the need because not all the pages have it. This page doesn't have the numbers, but uh, he apparently thought this might confuse people. So we'll it's numbers. something, and he does something here that's really smart. And if you want to go back to that page real quick, I'm just going to mention this because we're yeah. we're running a little long, but that's okay. It's the gutter. Yeah, so, um, so you get that middle panel, panel four. Uh, you've got a long panel because you want to accentuate the drop, the sense of energy, the, that the hazard that's coming. Right. And then you're going to pull back up to the upper right-hand corner again, and your energy is moving down. So how do you carry that energy and still right. flow? You drop the drawbridge. Yeah, and he, again, th this is little things that he understands about how to lay out a page, how to structure a page and how to keep things flowing. And again, even below the gate, what do you have? It's the porticus. The porticus is coming down. It's it's constant motion. It's constant flow. And after yep. you've done that, you've broken it up. And now we're moving across the drawbridge. And then we're back up at the ramparts. And again, what do we see? We see that beautiful water shot. Yeah. With the reflection on... The other thing is... Uh, and people who understand page layout like know this. Like, you lead the eye off the page on the last panels. And he's doing that with these last two, all the directions going. Yep, you know, right in, down to the right down to the page turn. And yeah, in a sense to this page turn. Yeah. Uh he also had a real strong sense. We talked about it a little bit, but um he loved the wilderness and he, he had a, a sense of wilderness survival. So like he threw that in as well. Like there's a scene where he uses a reed to breathe underwater after he jumps from the castle. Uh rescues Gawain. And uh, there's that story. It was a story of betrayal, but it was about a six page arc. Really fun uh, story that. And then right as it comes back, he starts with this uh, uh, beautiful oh, again, yeah. regal castle shot with great depth. You know, you got foreground, middle ground, background, and uh, yeah, just phenomenal stuff. And this is the earliest. This is all 1937, the first year of Prince Valiant, and he's telling this story and uh, just beautiful stuff. I was, uh, as I've been going through it, I've been thoroughly re impressed, you know, because I always thought it was cool reading the strip as a kid. But looking at it now, you know, I'm making my own book. Um, I'm getting a sense of like how you do things, and I'm looking at it now. This uh, such a such an appreciation for what he did like we said compositionally page layout storytelling uh and just artwork in general so. well like like we like i said too i mean when you're when you're when the people like frank frazetta joe kubert john Basema, jack kirby bob kane um the human xerox machine when they're when they're <laughs> citing you and borrowing from you and lifting from you um that that says everything you need to know um, yeah, and you can it, take me up big now. Okay. For the moment. So, yeah. So, and then, um, so you did have, did you, did you want to show some of the cull pages that kind of were directly inspired by this work, or do you want to hold off on that? It's entirely up to you, my friend. I will, I think we should, we should show some. I've never been shy about spoilers because I'm like, you know what? If you see it on a stream and you go, that looks cool, I want to buy that. It works for me. You know, it's like, I don't think anyone's going to be like, ah, oh, I saw it on a stream. Now I don't have to buy it. So, <laughs> you know, like it never, <laughs> Understood. never bothered me. Well, yeah. So, so let's see some of the, let's see. These are Odin's pages that were directly inspired by what Hal Foster did. On, yeah. And this is Call of Atlantis. Call of uh, Atlantis. The the precursor, the, the nascent form of Conan, if you will. Right. And they are very similar, and you know the backstory, how the two diverged into two different characters. It was actually a Cole story that didn't get published, so he changed the name to Conan, and uh, the rest is history. Indeed. But, but they are very similar, but they are distinct as well. 
So Cole went into public domain recently. And so when I was working on that out of obscurity anthology, I was going to do a Cole story. And then I decided, well, I'm going to just put it in the back of unconditional shove because, you know, something we were publishing with Broken Compass Comics and I wanted to um, uh, make it a very limited thing. So you can only get this Cole story that I did in this campaign, this first printing of unconditional shove. There may be a time when I put it in some kind of collected thing down the road, but I really want it to be special to the people who bought unconditional shove right off the rip and showed their their interest right off the rip so right so is this something that you're going to continue to do with unconditional shove will there always be a, a call story like this as a backup i hadn't thought of that and i i doubt it but on the same hand it was so much fun that i wouldn't be opposed to the idea and i actually never thought of that until you just mentioned it just now so i'm like maybe so we'll just say maybe we'll put a pin in it but Roger um that. but speaking to the the cole stuff it was uh the main idea was there's no voice bubble um on this page you know i use an open scroll uh to kind of do the lettering i'll hand lettered as well which was the first time i'd done that as well so that was fun nice touch nice touch yeah um yeah and i had a lot of fun with this i'll show i mean i can i'll show one of my favorite pages because there's there's several um, this one, and, and again, like learning process, there's there's things I would have done with the lettering uh, different, but, uh, you know, as you fumble through things, you learn. No, that's that's part of the process, too. And, and then there Absolutely. is something to be said, too, for, um, you know, especially with indie creating books, uh, owning something and being able to watch the progress. I know that's especially true. You mentioned Dean. Uh, looking right. at where he started off with the Embrace One and seeing where he is now, um, being able to just flip through the books and see that growth and that understanding uh, evolve is something that's certainly special. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, if you kind of believe in a creator and you you go, it'd be really cool to own that first edition when they first got going. Because, you know, some of my favorite creators, we, we were hanging out, James, you and I, the other day, and we were talking about James O'Barr and The Crow. And it's like to, ha to have something he did that was like early work, um, you know, just because you're like, yeah, I have that early stuff. So this one was a, a really fun page to draw. Um, similarly, trying to use <laughs> so much to wrap this story up because it's only six pages, but I was retelling the tale of uh, the mirrors of Tuzanthun, which is a story uh, from Cole, from the pulp Cole stories. Right. And um, I told it in poetic meter. And so every page has 10 lines. And um, very nice. This is fantastic, man. You hand lettered that? That's awesome. Yeah, that all hand lettered. Oh, everything was hand I, I yeah. think what I like most about the call is that you've somehow hand lettered the exact font <laughs> <that laughs> of the by uh, mistake. But, the uh, the Mike Plug books. That's fantastic. It's oh, almost yeah, like yeah. somebody sent you one. Yeah, well, and, and because it's in public domain for Robert Howard's Cole, there's certain things, you know, so hopefully it's not too much like the Plug stuff. There's certain things you can't do that Marvel did. Right. You know what I mean? So there is like gray areas and all this. Now that said, I'm probably not going to get any, and I'm only printing it here in this one volume. So even if they said like cease and desist or some shit, it's like, well, I don't think you have anything to worry about. Man. Yeah, I, I don't have anything fine. to worry about. But on the same hand, it was a lot of fun to just take this uh, story of the mirrors of Tuzanthun and just uh, retell right. it. So, Well, fantastic, my friend. Well, yeah. you know, and I, I don't think you have anything to worry about with, uh, you know, any of the lawyers or anything. That that right. being said, you never know. There's always one. I, got, I got an angle. So. Stern. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, Stern. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so Odin, thank you so much for joining us here in the yeah, gutter this you, evening. Uh, I apologize, we ran a little bit over. Uh, we try to stick to our our, uh, our one hour limit here uh, quite handedly. I appreciate everybody in the chat joining us. Yes. Uh, I'm sure you'll be back because you've got projects coming. Kill Them Dead is currently in sign up uh, over on Kickstarter, and from what I understand. 
and uh, Broken Compass Comics has tons of other stuff coming. So, uh, you know, closing yeah. words, sir. Do you have anything to, that you'd like to share? Uh, well, you mentioned Kill Them Dead. That is in sign up on Kickstarter. So uh, go sign up for that. Uh, really quick, saw that Jay Ryan showed up. So say hello to him. Um, yeah. And the, the last thing is Unconditional Shove with the Cole story is in demand on Indiegogo right now. But uh, only for a couple more weeks. And then it will be gone, and you will have missed the boat if you have not backed it yet. So, so strongly consider backing it, especially if you liked the the coal pages, because uh, it's probably the only place that's ever going to appear. Fantastic. Well, you know, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the the famous uh, you know refugee from the Soviet Union, said that today there are two major processes occurring in the world. One is a process of short-sighted concessions, a process of giving up and hoping that perhaps at some point the wolf will have eaten enough. The second process is a liberation of the human spirit. And my friend, I think you're, you're taking the second path, and I can't commend you enough for that. And on thank that you. note, thank you for joining us. In thank the you, Aldous. This is blood for blood and part of gallons. This is the old days, man, the bad days, the all or nothing days. They're back. There's no choices left. It's over. Go home. Go.